I can start before you get the papers. Uh, uh, Chairman Dunn, members of the board, my name is David Sly. Thank you for the chance to speak. Um, I'm going to ask you to just walk through some of these uh, pages that I've given you. And um, I want to start by talking about the fact that there, there's been a lot of discussion about deficiencies in the record, deficiencies in the reports that have been submitted. Uh, and I agree with a lot of that. But the deficiencies that I want to talk about are the fact that the response to comments, uh, nor any other source, has really given us the kind of now whatever is in the record, the facts and the figures and the studies, an analysis that ties those facts to how water quality standards will be met. That's the big deficiency to me because it is not there. It was not in the record for the citizens to comment on. It's not in the response to comments. And we don't have it to this, to this day. The board does not have that analysis. And that's the key link between the facts and the science and what that means for specific water quality standards conformance. Uh, I just, uh, the comparison here, uh, something that you all will have uh, some exposure to, and that is the PDS discharge permits. I used to be a, a permit writer, so I understand how they work, and I know that you spend a lot of time on specific individual permits in board meetings and making decisions as to whether they meet the legal standards. You will know that when one of those permits is brought to, before you, you have a fact sheet, you have an application, you have a lot of specifics that describe what the pollutants are in that discharge, what the stream characteristics are, and how this will meet standards, will meet the law. That's just, that's a routine thing that you see all the time. Um, we don't have, this is a much more complex, a much bigger and more threatening project than any one of those but you do not have that tie between the facts and the ways that water quality standards will be upheld under those facts. I, page three there is just a list, a partial list of what I term expert reports. There are reports from people like the uh, member of the cave board, like PEs and um, professional geologists. People who have given detailed information to DEQ, which is available to this board, but have not gotten in return detailed responses and detailed analyses to say what the staff thinks of those. And so you don't have that as a resource. That's something you should demand, something you should expect. To know that when there are specific, serious, significant technical issues raised, that they have been addressed in enough detail so that you can understand them. I'll move on to uh, page five, which starts my discussion of cumulative impacts. Uh, I talked to you some about this last week. Um, the complaint is that DEQ has not done a cumulative impacts analysis. Part of that, part of the reason for that is the segmentation of these processes between upland and in-stream work, uh, between erosion sediment control and stormwater. Um, but the fact is that that has not been done. Now DEQ's response, several general responses to that assertion, include the fact that FERC conducted a cumulative impacts analysis under its NEPA review. The second one, and I quote here, while federal NEPA regulations direct FERC to analyze cumulative impacts, there is no Virginia regulatory framework for DEQ to conduct such an analysis. And third, the core looked at cumulative impacts of activities cover, covered under Nationwide 12. Now I'll address those in order. The FERC cumulative impacts analysis is grossly insufficient. A big part of the reason for that, and I've listed a document here on page six that goes in. Others in the
in the record that explain this. But if you go to ch page seven, you'll see a map there. The FERC cumulative impacts analysis looked at cumulative impacts on a scale that is completely out of line with any, any scientific basis for doing cumulative impacts assessments. In, in many cases, in this here, which is in far western Virginia, along the, the boundary of uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and Highland County. The watershed of the size that 23 square miles in size. Now, yes, the pipeline and its impact, you may get some impacts downstream from that. But the scale at which cumulative impacts are really important, if I can ask you to go to page eight, are on the individual watershed level. And what I've depicted here is a watershed called Townsend Draft. You actually heard a little bit about it before. But the concentration of activities, the concentration of impacts in a relatively small drainage like this are going to be devastating. What you see here, among other things, uh, if you look at the map, you'll see six stream crossings all of which are either on brook trout streams or on my, uh, small tributaries that flow directly into brook trout streams. What you see is the pipeline traversing the watershed for a, a length of about two miles, coming down a slope that at times is over 70% slope. And on average, down that whole slope, I believe it's something like 40%. Then you see the pipeline running along the ridge line to the uh, southeast. That's a very, very narrow area described. It's going to have to be cut down for work to even be done there. The, there are access roads. There are several miles of access roads that are also on these steep slopes. So what I'm saying is there is such a concentration of impacts that will occur in this one small area. And it cannot be proposed that it's okay to look at upland versus in-stream uh, impacts. They will have a cumulative impact. And water quality standards are based on the result of activities on the land, not specific activities. Um, page nine just lists a whole slew of what I believe are some of the impacts that will occur in that small watershed. Uh, I know I say erosion sediment discharges from upland areas and from in-stream work. Now that's important because nobody, neither DEQ nor the company or anybody else is going to say that there won't be sediment discharges from either one or both. Of those, of those sources. But there has been no effort to look at those together. And if you don't look at those together, then you don't know the real impacts. And the setup that we have here, where we look at erosion sediment control sometime later, and we rely on the core looking at in-stream impacts, won't get you the results you have to have. A lot of these other impacts deal with changes to habitat in-stream. And again, those have DEQ's contention that there is no mechanism for them to look at cumulative impacts uh, is simply uh, not credible because that's exactly what you're asked to do right here today. You're asked to make an overall finding that water quality standards won't be violated, and the only time uh, the is to look at the combined impacts of all these all these effects. Now the, the contention that the core analysis of cumulative impacts is in any way useful for your decision is even more absurd than the FERC uh, assumption because they looked at cumulative impacts on a national scale for the nationwide permit. That does you no good. That provides you no information that's of any use. Um, we can go on to number 12. 
just the fact that I know that it, it may give you some comfort to believe that having these future plans approved at some point and then to this certification uh, may make you feel some comfort. But the fact is that we don't know what the outcome of those plan approvals will be. The staff has significant latitude in what it will approve and what the effects of those approvals will be. Um, the staff is able to make variances, to allow variances, and to make waivers of standard. Uh, um, and we've heard uh, last week, you heard about the open trench rules. The fact that the general rule is no more than 500 feet of open trench at any one time, and there's a reason for that. Now, the 500 foot amount is not the key because that's just that's an arbitrary number, but the principle is important. And we've talked about people have talked about the storms, the intensity of storms, the slopes. When you talk about having trench lengths open for miles, which is something DEQ has allowed on numerous occasions. You've got to figure out what the effects of that will be. And we have looked, citizens have made information requests and looked at a series of those variances that were given, and we found not one piece of analysis as to the basis for those variances. Not one piece of analysis that said, it's okay for water quality because it's not there. Now, I've talked a lot about these, so I'm going to have to rush through the next portion, which is the Corps of Engineers, but reliance on the Corps of Engineers nationwide trails and 12 is improper for a number of reasons. But you've heard repeatedly here today that this would just be duplicative. If DEQ looks at the end stream, the crossings, that's just duplicating what the Corps does. Well, why did Congress decide to give those two separate responsibilities to the state and the federal agency? They did it for a very simple reason, because those two agencies, those two entities, have different viewpoints, different values, and different rules that they have to abide by. The, the regulations, the 404B1 guidelines that govern the Corps are not like our water quality standards. They do not specifically reflect our water quality standards. And the Corps has no authority to either make judgments on our standards or to enforce them. The Corps has admitted that operations, that effects that happen under their nationwide 12 can cause problems, can cause impairments that are explicitly violations of our standards. The one that is most glaring is that they admit in their documents approving Nationwide 12 that in some cases recreational uses on streams will be eliminated. That couldn't be a more explicit statement that our standards, the standards you're here to uphold, can well be violated, can predictably be violated with some of these stream crossings, unless you do something to stop it. Because the Corps of Engineers has decided that that's okay under their standards. One other thing that um, the staff, I, I had a slide earlier and I kind of skipped over it, but when the staff made their DEIS comments on ACP and MDP, I sent Director Paler a letter and I said, we think your technical staff did a good job. I think I used the word excellent. You looked at a lot of the right stuff, you called for a lot of the right, right stuff. Now all you have to do is translate that into the requirements that apply for this 401 certification. Because you've identified those problems, now please make them count in relation to water quality standards. And on, let's see, I think it's on page 17 here. The state staff basically said that if you don't do some fairly intensive study of these stream and wetland crossing sites, that we're concerned that there will be that, that there could be permanent changes to those habitats and that those aquatic systems could not be re returned to their prior functioning. 
You should pay attention to that. Please reject these certi this certification. Thank you.